G'day again, it's Richard Maher from Mars Classes. In this presentation I'm going to try and um, give you an idea of how you can go about solving any problems that uh, are presented to you looking at the talk or moment in a, a particular situation. So this strategy should work for most situations you will be given in an assessments or problem sets or, or um, exams and that sort of thing. Uh, you'll often be given uh, a, a setting whereby uh, a lot of data is given in a, in a written description. Uh, what my suggestion would be is you transfer any known quantitative data from the question and you put it into a sizable diagram. Why, why I say sizable is because you're going to be adding lots of information to it and if you make the diagram too small it'll get uh, too cluttered and it'll be very hard to um, determine what's actually going on. Once you've got the data from the question, uh, look for any data you can derive from the question and add that to your diagram as well. So that might be um, dimensions of length or maybe additional forces or um, even the moments you can add to it. Uh, you should select a pivot point actually uh, before you do any of those moment additions uh, and the pivot point should be selected uh, when you look at each individual question. Usually the pivot point is uh, selected so that one of the forces that we don't know is acting through it and that means you don't have to include the moment from that force if it's acting through the pivot point. So it'll reduce the unknown values um, in your situation. Um, then you label any of your moments um, as clockwise or anti-clockwise. Now, initially when you do these sort of problems, uh, some of you will have difficulty determining what is a clockwise and what is an anti-clockwise moment. Throughout this presentation, I'll give you some ideas on how you can um, work that out. Uh, once you've got all those labelled, you're going to use the fact that when something's in equilibrium, the uh, sum of the forces will equal zero, or the sum of the moments will equal zero, to help you solve for the unknown value that remains in your um, diagram. Once you've done that, uh, you should be able to again use the sum of the um, forces equal zero, or the sum of the moments equal zero, to solve for that other unknown value, the one that was acting through the pivot point. So let's have a look at a few examples. I'm going to start with a pretty simple one. It's one whereby there's a bench uh, with legs where they tell you where the legs are. Uh, it tells you it's a uniform bench, so you know the centre of mass is in the geometric centre of the object. And it's asking where can a as what weight can a person be if they sit uh, 0.1 of a metre from the end of the bench? Uh, what weight can they be before the bench starts to tip? So I've, I've put all the data that's in the question into my diagram. Now I'm going to do some derivable data, and that is um, the distance from the centre of mass to each of the legs. I've put a couple of uh, reaction forces on each of the legs. The ground will um, be exerting a reaction force against the legs. And I've put in the distance the person is from one of those legs as well. The next thing I'll do is select a pivot point that will reduce the unknown values. Now the unknown values at the moment are the reaction forces on each of the legs. Now the leg I've labelled A, or we're showing the reaction at A, uh, is the, the leg that is going to pivot over if someone sits. If, if it does actually tip, the leg which I've labelled where the reaction of B is will leave the ground and that reaction of B won't exist anymore. So what I'll do is I'll take a pivot at the base of the leg I've labelled where reaction of A is. That means I don't have to worry about the uh, force of A because it's going through the pivot point. It doesn't have a radius, it doesn't have a turning effect. Once I've done that, I'll label any um, moments. Now, I'll label the weight of the person um, as providing an anti-clockwise moment and the weight of the uh, bench itself as providing a clockwise moment. How did I determine that those were the directions of the moments? Well, what you could do is think of that pivot point as fixed. And I've put a blue dot there to show that it's fixed. If there's a force where the person is and it's pushing down on that point there and there is no other force, what effect would that one force have if the pivot point stays where it is? Well, what it would do is it would push the bench down and it would rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. If the force wasn't where the person is, if the force slid along and is where the centre of mass of the um, bench is, it would push it in a clockwise direction. So always look at your diagrams and think what will happen if this is the only force acting and the pivot point is fixed. Which direction will the um, situation rotate in? Okay, let's have a look at another uh, type of question. This type of question is very, very similar. It's got a person on a structure um, and he's cleaning windows. It's similar to the bench, except instead of not knowing what the reaction forces are, we've got two tension forces on the two cables supporting him. Uh, he's on a uniform structure. Uh, the centre of mass is in the middle of a 3.5 metre length uh, structure. Uh, John's weight we don't know at the moment, um, but... Um, we 
know the force is up and we know the other force down. So where we've got any, any add any derivable data to the diagram, we can put in the fact that the center of mass is 1.75 meters from the line of action of the forces of the cables. We can put in John's weight because the sum of the forces down will equal the sum of the forces up. And we can put in the distance John's weight acts from the center of mass as x. So there's an unknown. Uh, and because we want to find what x is, um, well, the first part we've done, part A, to determine John's weight, the force is down, equal the force is up. But the next one's how far is he standing from the uh, center of the platform. We want to find what x is. So let's do the pivot through the center of the platform. And if the uh, pivot point is through the center of the platform, we can now label any moments due to the forces. The weight force of the platform itself acts through that pivot point, so it doesn't have any turning effect. But the two cables have turning effects, as does John's weight. So let's put in the um, moment directions there is clockwise and anti-clockwise. Once we've got them, we know that the sum of the clockwise moments equals the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. And when we're determining um, those values, the only value we don't know is x. So we're solving for one unknown. We can determine what distance John was from the um, center of mass of that platform. OK, let's have a look at another type of question. Now this type of question is, a, an, again, another very typical one where we've got a bridge. And this time there are two piers at either end of the bridge and there are a couple of vehicles on the bridge. It's a uniform bridge. I've transferred all the data from the question, uh, the, the weight of the truck and the weight of the car and the weight of the bridge and it's a uniform bridge and I've put the dimensions of the distances and that sort of thing. Now any derivable data I can now add to the diagram. So uh, I've got the reaction forces at both of the piers. I've labelled the, the one um, that the truck is travelling towards as A and the one that the they're moving away from as B. Uh, there's reaction forces at each of them. I've put in the dimensional distance of the car from A as 22.1 and I've put in the distance of the um, center of mass from A as 14.85. So when I'm looking at the pivot point of this I've got two unknown forces. I've got the force at A and the force at B. If I take a pivot point either through A or B uh, it'll remove the need for me to worry about those forces because they won't have a turning effect. So let's do it through A. We'll put a pivot point through A. Now I can have a look at the turning effects of all of the forces, the weight force of the bridge, the car and the truck, and the reaction force at B. And when I plug them in, I get that there are three anti-clockwise moments which we've balanced by a clockwise moment. And when we look at those, the anti-clockwise moments, we've got the uh, magnitudes of each of the forces and the distances from the pivot point. And the uh, clockwise moment, we know its distance from the pivot point, but we don't know the magnitude of the force. So there's only one unknown. We can solve for B, our force at B. And once we've got the force at B, to determine the force at A, all we say is the sum of the um, forces down will equal the sum of the forces up. And it's very straightforward to determine the reaction force at A. Let's have a look at another type of question, which is a very typical type of question. Um, and this is one whereby you have a, a beam hanging by a cable. Now I've transferred all of the information from the question onto the diagram, uh, which is that they give the, the length of the beam, they say where the center of the mass of the beam is, it's not a uniform mass in this case, and they say that the person is moving away from the pivot point P. This one they've told us the pivot point, we don't have to worry about determining where the pivot point was. So when we're looking at any other derivable data, we've got to look at things like, well, we've got the downward weight force of the person and of the beam, we know there's going to be some sort of force at P. We don't know what direction or magnitude it is. But what about the cable? What direction is that, that force? We know it's, going to, it's being pulled apart by the, the weight um, of the beam pushing down and it's fixed up to the wall. How can we determine what direction we're going to put as for the force of that one? What you do in that instance to determine the direction of the force on the cable is imagine the cable wasn't there. This thing is currently in equilibrium, but imagine the cable wasn't there. The whole beam would rotate down in a clockwise direction around the pivot point P. But because the cable is there, it must be pulling it back up. So because we know that the cable is pulling it back up, we know that the, there must be a tension along that cable going upwards. Now when we're trying to work out the um, moment of that uh, force on the cable, we need to know its perpendicular distance from the pivot point. So we can use some trigonometry there to determine that that R is 2.4, which is the hypotenuse of the beam, times the sine of 50. Uh, once we've got that, uh, we can add in uh, a few other things. Um, we can work out that if the tension of the cable exceeds the breaking strain of the cable, well then it will snap. 
So let's have a look at what else we can do. Uh, we've, we've selected the pivot point already, we don't have to worry about that. So let's label the clockwise and anti-clockwise moments. Um, the person uh, is moving, uh, sorry, the, the fixed uh, clockwise moment is the weight of the beam and the fixed anti-clockwise moment is the one of the cable just before it will break. But the person's um, clockwise moment will vary as they move along. Now we do know the weight of the person so the one thing we don't know is what distance from P it, the person must have moved before the clockwise moments exceed the anti-clockwise moments. So again, there's only one unknown in our um, equation of sum of anti-clockwise moments equals sum of clockwise moments, and that is the distance the person is from uh, the pivot point P. Okay, try one more. A very, very typical sort of one. I'm not going to give any uh, data on this one. Just show you the very typical sort of question you might get, which is something like a ladder resting on rough ground against a smooth wall. Now um, the ladder will have a weight which will be uh, acting straight downwards and there might be a person climbing up that ladder, a guy climbing up that ladder. Now uh, there's going to be a reaction at the wall but because it's a smooth wall there's no friction so the reaction will be a normal reaction force at the wall. By normal I mean perpendicular. So there's a normal reaction at the wall. Now there's also going to be a reaction at the ground which has to balance, if it's in equilibrium, has to balance the weight of the ladder and the man and the reaction at the wall. But we don't know what magnitude it's going to be because at the moment we don't know the reaction at the wall's magnitude. So this reaction at the ground could be um, in any direction that, as indicated there or any magnitude. We really don't know. So let's select the pivot around the force we know the least about, which is the reaction at the ground. So if we put the pivot there, now we've got um, the weight of the man, the weight of the ladder, we'll know the perpendicular distance from the pivot of both of those, we've got the reaction at the wall, we'll know the perpendicular distance that, that is from the pivot. We can look at the clockwise and anti-clockwise moments and sum them. And once we do that, we'll be able to determine uh, the reaction force at the wall. Now if we add together all the forces we know, which is the weight of the ladder, the weight of the man and the reaction force at the wall, and we know that this situation is in equilibrium, there must be another force that allows that to go into equilibrium, the other force that enables the sum of the forces to equal zero. And that other force is going to be the reaction at the ground. So now, based on that little triangle we've drawn there, we'll know the magnitude of the reaction force and we can use some trigonometry to work out the direction of it as well. So let's apply that type of um, a setup to a, a real situation. And this is a bit more complex, this one. Uh, this is with a crane. And we're saying that a simple crane has a two-ton beam pivoted at the ground um, and it's supporting a five ton load. We don't actually, we're not actually given the length of the um, crane, we just said that the centre of mass is a third along the length of the crane. So let's add on the data they've told us. They've told us the weight of the um, beam and the weight of the uh, load and they're asking us now to determine the tension of the steel cable and also the magnitude of the reaction force. So if we put in the, the load and the beam forces and put in the pivot because it says that it's pivoted at the ground, we've now got all that data added into there. Um, the derivable data we can put in is the same sort of thing we said before about the cable. What direction is the force on the cable? Now imagine the cable wasn't there. What would happen is the beam would fall to the ground around the pivot in a clockwise direction. So the cable must be providing a force down and away from the top of the cable, and that's the tension force in the cable. And again, we need to know its perpendicular distance um, from the pivot. How can we determine that when they haven't given us, given us any lengths? Well, let's just call the length of the um, beam L, but before we do, we've got to do some geometry. Uh, in the bottom triangle there, I've uh, determined that 53.1 is the angle uh, down there and there's another 53.1 on the other side so in between we've got 73.8 to make up the 180 degrees. There's a, a 90 degree angle in that um, between the T and the R and up the top there's going to be 16.2 degrees. So if I said the hypotenuse was length L I could substitute for R, I could actually put in a value now in terms of L. I could say that R was L sine 16.2 and looking at that the similar sort of thing. I could look along the bottom and where the weight force of the beam and the weight force of the load are acting, their perpendicular distance of the line of action of their forces to the pivot can also be expressed in terms of L. And we've got uh, one third L cos 53.1 for the weight of the beam and L cos 53.1 for the weight of the load's uh, radius. So once I've got all them, I can now put in my clockwise and anti-clockwise moments. Um, 
because the pivot point's already selected. So once I put in those moments, I can now solve, even though there are two unknowns, the tension is unknown and the L is unknown, because the L is going to appear on both sides of my equation, it will cancel out. And I can then determine what the tension is. Uh, the second part of the question, part B, oh, so I can determine T from that. And the second part asked me to determine the magnitude of the reaction force. So what we do is we say, look, we know that um, the weight force is down of the load and the beam and the tension, which we've just calculated, must be balanced by another force or else it wouldn't be in equilibrium. And that other force is going to be RG, or the reaction at the ground. This time we don't have a right triangle though. We've got 126.9 degrees in between the weight forces and the tension. So we're going to have to use the cos rule to do um, our calculation to determine G. And then we're probably going to have to use the sine rule to determine the um, direction of that reaction force too. But I hope you can see that every one of these questions, which started off quite simply and have now got pretty complex, are using the same strategy each time. If you can sit down each time you look at a question, draw a diagram, put all the data from the question into the diagram, uh, add any additional uh, data you might be able to derive. Make sure you've got a pivot point that um, can get rid of um, any extraneous forces or things that um, reduce the number of forces you've got to calculate. And then label your, your uh, moments. As you see I've used a convention here of green for clockwise moments and red for anti-clockwise moments. I found if you look at that diagram there it's really complex. Um, what you've got to do is make it legible. So I've, I've used that convention uh, all the time just so I can easily see what's going on. And once you've done that, you should be able to solve for a force. And then once you've got uh, most of the forces and there's one remaining, you just know that the sum of the forces will equal zero and either you look at the forces up equal the forces down or you draw a triangle and the, and the remaining force completes the um, remaining side of the triangle. Look, I think that's enough for tonight. I'll uh, leave that until next time. See ya.